Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Once again, good morning. It's a great privilege and joy for me to be able to open God's word with you. This morning, we are going through the Come and See series and concluding the section called God's New People today, uh, the section in which we looked at the church, God's, uh, the community of God's people. And starting next week, we look at the mission of God's people, and that uh, brings us uh, almost to the end of uh, this long series. But before we move on today, we... Uh, look at the church once again, and uh, especially consider its brokenness, the brokenness of of the church. So before we read our scripture text, let me read for us uh, from the contemporary testimony, Our World Belongs to God. This is paragraph 40 from Our World Belongs to God. We grieve that the church, which shares one spirit, one faith, one hope, and spends all time, place, race, and language has become a broken communion in a broken world. When we struggle for the truth of the gospel and for the righteousness God demands, we pray for wisdom and courage. When our pride and or blind when our pride or blindness hinders the unity of God's household, we seek forgiveness. Yet we marvel that the Lord gathers the broken pieces to do his work and that he blesses us still with joy, new members, and surprising evidences of of unity. We commit ourselves to seeking and expressing the oneness of, of all who follow Jesus and pray for brothers and sisters who suffer for their faith. A lot of these words uh, echoes what Paul says in Ephesians 4, which is our text today. So let's now turn to Ephesians 4, and we will read verses 1 to 6, and then 11 to 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Thus far, the word of the Lord. For many of you, I'm sure this passage uh, from Ephesians 4 is a familiar one. Um, If I remember correctly, this is the fourth time uh, since I came to New West that a sermon is being preached on this particular text. And it's my second time preaching on this text, Uh, the last one being about a year ago when we were going through the letter to the Ephesians. I 
uh, preached on this text, and at that time, I did a fair bit of exegesis of the, the passage. I don't expect you to remember all that, uh, but today, instead of doing that again and going through all the details of the passage, um, if you want, uh, you can always watch that sermon again on YouTube. But today, uh, issue with the mic. Maybe it's better to get a new one. Thank you. I was actually using Pastor Andrew's mic, so maybe it knows who it belongs to. <laughs> Sorry, where was I? Um, yeah, so today, instead of going through all the details of the text, I want to focus on the theme of unity and um, be guided by the paragraph that we read together from the contemporary testimony and, and think about, again, the unity of the Church of Christ uh, with the recognition that, uh, that we see the brokenness of, of the body of Christ in the Church. So this morning, let's consider three things. First, the brokenness uh, of the Church that we have caused. Second, the unity of the Church that Christ has established. And lastly, our response to that gift of unity um, in Christ. So our brokenness, Christ's unity, and our response. So first, the brokenness or this unity we have caused in the church. And listen to what Sid Kuparas, uh, Pastor Sid Kuparas, who was here at our church as we were beginning the series, the author of the study booklet that we are going through. Uh, he says... The oneness and unity of the Christian church is a mystery to behold. The testimony of believing in one holy Catholic church, uh, that is the universal church, is more wishful thinking than reality. There are examples of warfares like the Irish Roman Catholic Church and Irish Protestant churches that have been fighting one another for the past four centuries. Uh, an author by the name of Richard Niebuhr wrote a book called The Social Sources of Denominationalism, which speaks of the churches of the, middle, uh, of the middle class, the churches of nationalism, churches of immigrants, and churches of racial lines. There are German Baptists, Polish Catholics, Greek Orthodox, Norwegian, Lutherans, Dutch Calvinists, Swedish Evangelical Free, Korean Presbyterians, um, there, there are more than a hundred Korean Presbyterian denominations, believe it or not. South American Reformed, Spanish Catholics, British Anglicans, Black Pentecostal, Moravian Brethren, and so many more. He also speaks about our denomination. He first mentions the Reformation in the 16th century, and then he says, from this Reformed branch, comes the Christian Reformed Church of North America, the CRC, the Reformed Church of America, RCA, the Free Reformed Church, the Netherlands Reformed, the United Orthodox Reformed, and the Canadian Reformed Church, all of whom share the same creeds and confessions. And most churches will not worship together, let alone uh, work or walk side by side. Each time a church goes through another separation, schism, or split, it is justified on biblical grounds while ignoring the biblical plea for unity, harmony, and community. Now, I, uh, I personally think uh, that's a bit of oversimplification. Uh, it's more complex than that, but undeniably, it indeed is sad reality of the Church of Christ, and it continues to be the case in our time too. 
When I was a student at Regent College, uh, a school that has a significant Anglican influence, I saw the Anglican Church of Canada going through a major split over the issue of same-sex marriage and ordination. About 10 years later, Presbyterian Church USA went through the same thing and a number of new denominations split from PCUSA. Just two weeks ago, so that was Sunday, May 1st, I read the news that a large new denomination called Global Methodist Church split off from the United Methodists. Last year, Reformed Church in America, our sister denomination, they too experienced churches leaving the denomination to form another denomination and network such as the new uh, Alliance of Reformed Churches, ARC, or the Kingdom Network. And as you know, this is a real issue for our denomination as well, as we anticipate a highly controversial synod this coming June, um, in which I will be participating as an ethnic advisor. Many people I've heard are saying that some kind of separation is inevitable as we deal with the adoption of the human sexuality report. And while by no means I'm uh, disparaging the importance of the discussion on human sexuality, still, it is disheartening to see churches split and the kind of witness uh, that is to the world. I'm sure many of you have heard from a friend, a non-Christian friend, or a neighbor ask, why are there so many churches? And I think that's a fair question. Um, in our immediate neighborhood, so within the 10 minutes walking distance from our church, are more than 10 churches. Certainly, that can be perceived as evidence of this unity. So what do we do? How do we respond to this call? We read in verse 3 where Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity. What do we do? Do we, do we merge churches? Do we merge denominations? I think for us to be able to answer that question, make every effort to keep the unity, for us to be able to answer that question, we must first ask ourselves, where does the unity come from? Where does the unity first come from? And that brings us to the second point. This unity, it's the unity that Christ has established. It's the unity that Christ has established. Paul says in verses 4 to 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So very obviously, we did not create this unity, right? How can we? In these verses, we see the unity of the triune God. One Father, one Lord, one spirit and then flowing out from this divine this triune unity are the kinds of unity we experience as his people being one body having one faith having one hope and be of one baptism so the unity that we are called to to um, maintain to keep is the unity that's been given to us it's not from us. We have nothing to do with creating this unity. It's been gifted to us in Christ. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father. Do you know what that means? This unity is not fragile. This unity is not vulnerable. This unity rests on the oneness of God. Our hope, our faith, our body, our baptism are one, not because we make it so, but because they are in the realm of God. This unity 
does not depend on us. So here is the very bold claim that I want to make this morning. We didn't have the ability to create this unity, so we don't have the ability to break this unity. We don't have the ability, we didn't have the ability to, to create this unity, therefore, we don't have the ability to break this unity. It is Christ who preserves his church and unites his church. That's why in June, I'm going to sin it, not with fear. Yes, there is uncertainty. Yes, there is division and there is lament. But it is Christ who was and is and is going to preserve his church and unite his church. That's why John Stott says in his commentary on Ephesians, these words. Just as we didn't attain this unity ourselves, we can't break this unity. It is indestructible. Is that to say all the division and separation is okay? No, by no means. But that brokenness caused by us doesn't break. The unity Christ has already established for us. We admit our mistakes and continue to walk toward that unity by how? Not by trying to merge churches and denominations, as good as that will be, but by simply following Jesus more and more. Jesus, who is the Lord of our unity, who is the maker and creator of our unity. I don't know about you, but this gives me tremendous comfort. The unity that Christ has established will not be destroyed by our mistakes, our sin, or our stupidity. Yes, we are to mourn and we are to lament the brokenness we have caused upon the church of Christ, upon the body of Christ. And we need to repent and, and ask for forgiveness. But we do so with the right perspective that Christ, who is the head of the church, will preserve and unite his church no matter what. That's the testimony of the church throughout history. And we continue to participate in that unity simply by following, loving, worshiping, and proclaiming Jesus more and more. So now we ask, how do we respond? How do we respond, respond to this unity that's been given to us? How do we live a life worthy of the unity Christ has given to us? As Paul says in verse 1. Paul invites us, and, and we want to pay attention to his language. Paul invites us to maintain this unity in verse 3, and then to attain this unity in verse 13. So clearly, it is not the unity that we create. We don't have ability to do that, but Paul calls us, and Jesus calls us to maintain this unity and attain the full measure of this unity that is already completed in Christ. How do we do that? Well, Paul has been describing this unity as the body of Christ. Christ is our head and we are his body. And he says in verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Speaking the truth in love. That's the practice. That's what we do to maintain and attain the unity, speaking the truth in love. Now, that translation is a, a little bit misleading because in Greek, there is no word for speaking. It simply says, truthing in love. Truthing in love, the verb form of truth. So this is basically calling all God's people to hold on their hands truth 
and love in perfect harmony. Speak truth, act truth, live by truth, proclaim God's truth in love. For truth without love is not true, and love without truth is not loving at all. Once again, what John Stott says in his commentary is helpful. He says, Thank God there are those in the contemporary church who are determined at all costs to defend and uphold God's revealed truth. But sometimes they are conspicuously lacking in love. When they think they smell heresy, they, their nose begins to twitch, their muscles to ripple, and the light of battle enters their eye. They seem to enjoy nothing more than a fight. Others make the opposite mistake. They are determined at all costs to maintain and exhibit brotherly love, but in order to do so are prepared even to sacrifice the central truth of revelation. He continues, <clears throat> both these tendencies are unbalanced and unbiblical. Truth becomes hard if it is not softened by love. Love becomes soft it is not, if it is not strengthened by truth. The apostle calls us to hold the two together, which should not be difficult for spirit-filled believers since the Holy Spirit himself is the spirit of the truth and his first fruit is love. There is no other route than this to a fully mature Christian unity. Now, he says it shouldn't be difficult. I don't know about that. Maybe it wasn't for him. But we know how difficult it is to hold the truth and love in perfect harmony in our hands. Some people are trying to be nice and loving at the expense of truth. Some people are from the Netherlands and they are very direct, telling the truth with love, right? None of us, regardless of culture, ethnicity, personality, none of us, I don't think, can in our own uh, endeavor, in our own power, can keep truth and love together in a perfect balance because of our, our sinfulness and our selfishness. Why are some of us more loving than others and fail to tell the truth? Because we're not loving enough. We're afraid or we don't care that much because telling the truth requires a lot of courage, commitment, and love. What about those, us, those of us who tell the truth but are, but, but are not very loving? Those who love the truth but are, but are not very loving. Again, it's our self-centeredness. Telling the truth because I'm right. Telling the truth not out of love for you but out of concern for myself. Again, no one is capable of holding truth and love in perfect balance. But who was Jesus on the cross died for us because of the truth, the truth that we are all sinners, that we all deserve God's punishment. But at the same time, he is love. He died on the cross because he loved us. That's the greatest truth and the greatest love anyone can ever give you at the same time. Because when Jesus went to the cross, on the cross, he is telling us the most insulting words we can ever, we have ever heard. On the cross, he is saying to us, you are hopeless. You deserve death. No one can save you except me. That's the truth. But again, on the cross, he was also saying, I love you. I love you so much that I'm going to die for you. 
truth and love hold in perfect harmony. So how do we respond to the unity of Christ that has been established on the cross? How do we maintain and attain this unity of the body? Truth and love. Knowing how miserably lost we were and how unconditionally loved we are. And that changes everything. That changes all our perspective. And that changes how we treat others. Truth and love. This is what it means to truthing in love. And this is what it means to live a life worthy of what God has done for us in and through Jesus Christ. This is how we maintain and attain the unity Christ has accomplished for us. As we have read, contemporary testimony puts it so beautifully. It says, we marvel that the Lord gathers the broken pieces. The broken pieces that that we have created. Our Lord gathers them to do his work. And that he blesses us still with joy, new members, and surprising evidences of unity surprising evidences of unity i said there are more than 10 churches in our neighborhood in one sense maybe that's the sign of our brokenness but god redeems even our broken pieces and then he gathers them to do his work Over the years, I had the privilege of getting to know some of those churches and their pastors and even uh, working together with them. Uh, Pastor Keith is the English pastor at Burnaby Alliance Church, which is just a few blocks down the road. They have three congregations, Mandarin, Cantonese, and English. A few years ago when we were doing the Kairos course, uh, we were able to pray together for God's kingdom to be established in this neighborhood. There is a Spanish-speaking, Spanish-speaking Nazarene church on 11th Avenue and 2nd Street. It's called Casa del Alfarero. Uh, Pastor Rigo is from Honduras, and they loved being at our multicultural worship nights and praising our Father together. There is also a Korean church sharing their building called Calvary Korean Presbyterian Church. Pastor Park became a good friend and he would often drop by at our church to have coffee with me. Westminster Bible Chapel, Pastor Brian is from South Africa. He is someone Pastor Andrew and I would pray together for our neighborhoods. On the 10th Avenue, there is new Westminster Evangelical Free Church. Their new pastor, Pastor Jorge, is Taiwanese pastor who was born in Argentina in a Buddhist family and came to study at UBC and became a pastor. They also have a Korean and a Japanese congregation meeting in their facility. New Life Community Church, where Pastor Sandeep from India is pastoring, someone I went to Regent College together. And now their youth and our youth and the youth from Nelson Ave uh, CRC are gathering together every month to worship God. They just met at our church this past Friday. And of course, there is House for All Nations, the Indonesian congregation that we share our building with. Their church, the Indonesian service takes place in the sanctuary, the Mandarin service takes place in the meeting hall, and the English service takes place in the school gym. Sign of brokenness? Maybe. But it is also the sign of God working through us, despite our brokenness, uniting us in Christ as we follow Jesus, love Jesus, praise Jesus more and more. Let me finish by reading once again from Sid Kuperis. He, he says, The mystery behind all denominational differences and divisions, all national identities and cultural distractions is this amazing sense of unity that comes with believing in one God and Father of all, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one spirit who moves and guides that body, his church. 
Jesus still remains at the center of churches, helping all churches to grow in maturity with Christ Jesus as the head of his body. Churches all around the world have so much in common as they come together in worship of a triune God, as they minister to one another in teaching and fellowship, caring for their own, and as they reach out to their communities with help, healing, and hope. The lament of one church's brokenness, division, and distraction helps call the body back to her center, being Christ Jesus, renewed and refreshed in her vision of raising the lost and welcoming the found. Amen. Amen.